We are very pleased this evening to welcome Dr. Alan Kafka, who joins us to introduce our speaker. Dr. Kafka is the chairman of the Department of Geology and Geophysics at Boston College, and his research includes uh, interests, his research interests include seismology, earthquake hazards, science education, and especially science and public policy. Please welcome Dr. Alan Kafka. Hi, I'm, I'm here to introduce the speaker, and um, you're, you're here to hear Susan, not me, but just let me say a couple of words. Um, Susan Huff, Dr. Susan Huff, um, graduated uh, with a bachelor's degree from UC Berkeley in 1982 with a PhD um, in earth sciences from UC San Diego. And she's now, the, uh, she's now a seismologist at the US Geological Survey in Pasadena. Um, I asked Sue if she would give me a quick statement that I could use to tell you what she's going to tell you. And she said, it's a sort of voyage of discovery of a wholly new class of earthquakes first recognized only in 1992. Seemed intriguing to me. I hope it seems intriguing to you. And you want to hear her, not me. So here's Dr. Susan Huff. Thank you. I brought along some reprints and flyers. I'm going to move them before I knock them off the podium. So I'll be back. Um, if you're interested, we'll try to figure out a way where you can pick them up after the talk. Um, I wanted to thank uh, the museum for its wonderful hospitality and Alan for coming out. Uh, it's been great to see a friendly face uh, away from home. Um, a little known fact, I was actually born in Cambridge. I uh, lived here with my family for six weeks. And, and then I left. Um, and we came back for about a year when I was five. I have early childhood memories of the area, but have managed to not spend a lot of time in Boston as an adult, so it's always a pleasure to, to come back and have a chance to, to be here. Um, some other organizations that are responsible for me being here are listed on the right, and most of them probably don't mean anything to you. IRIS is the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology a group of uh, universities that get together to do earthquake research, the Seismological Society of America, and finally the U.S. Geological Survey, which is my home institution. So I put together a proposal to give this talk over a year ago, and I came up with this title, The Very Long Reach of Very Large Earthquakes. And I had something in mind uh, when I came up with that title. I was thinking that people might find it intriguing and they might be a little bit curious about what I really meant. And then about a month ago, the Earth went and provided us with a spectacular illustration of the very long reach of very large earthquakes, but not in the way that I had in mind. So I'm guessing that a lot of you are here because this earthquake was, has just made such a huge impact on public awareness. Um, and so I took my talk apart and put it back together so that I could start with uh, some words about this earthquake and sort of what it means for people in other areas. Um, then I'm going to talk about something that's sort of become a diversion of mine. Um, you'll see it when we get to it. And finally, I'm going to get to this voyage of discovery, this new class of earthquakes that we've recognized. And I'm going to try to do all that in 50 minutes. So. Okay, the story of the Sumatra earthquake, I want to start here by talking about the actual waves that this earthquake generated in the crust. Every earthquake generates seismic waves. And so this earthquake happened, as I'm sure you know, here in Indonesia. It was a magnitude 9 earthquake. That's an enormous earthquake, sort of the biggest kind of event we see on the planet just about. Uh, they only happen every few decades on average. The last one of close to this magnitude, actually a little bigger, was in 1964 in Alaska. The one before that was actually just a few years before 1960 in Chile. And those were magnitude, uh, Alaska was about 9.2. Chile was actually 9.5. That's the biggest earthquake that we've seen in, in rec recent recorded history. So a uh, very rare earthquake, but if you look at the shaking from this earthquake, that's what's shown in this figure that was done by a young Indian colleague of mine, 
by name of Stacey Martin. This shows how the ground actually shook as people perceived it, and the purple means that people felt it, but really very lightly. Uh, getting up here, it was a little bit stronger, but not really strong enough to cause damage. Here in Indonesia, the shaking was stronger, um, still not devastating, although it's possible here that we're missing information, because if you try to figure out what happened during the earthquake, um, you need to observations of what the, the damage was after the shaking, but then the tsunami came in and caused catastrophic damage, killed a lot of people. So it's possible that we really don't know how strong the ground shook. But the point is that if the earthquake waves had been the only thing that had happened, um, <clears throat> this earthquake would not be on everybody's minds the way it, it has been. So the next slide, oh, I don't know why there's a B up there. Okay, as in letter B. Okay, so I'm going to show a blow-up of that area. So the Indonesia, it's a little hard for me to see the, the uh, screen from the angle that I'm at, but uh, Sumatra is down here. And what this is is the extent of the earthquake itself. And we name earthquakes after places, the San Francisco earthquake, the BAM earthquake, and that sort of gives you a sense that earthquakes happen at spots. Well, a lot of you probably know that earthquakes happen on faults, and the longer the fault, the bigger the earthquake. So uh, this was an enormous fault, and for those of you that aren't familiar with this part of the world, that's California for scale. This rupture was as long as the state of California. The actual fault that moved was like having an earthquake from the Mexican border all the way up to Washington in one fell swoop. It didn't happen all at once, and that's the colors on this map. Uh, you probably can't see the scale, but it started down here, and it grew up in this direction. And if you could see the scale, you'd see 600 at the top. That's seconds. It took 10 minutes for this fault from the time it started till the time it finally ended, which is just a massive earthquake and sort of difficult to get your arms around. Okay, well, when an earthquake like that happens, this is what we call a subduction zone earthquake. So the Indian, under the Indian Ocean, you have oceanic crust, and it's sinking beneath uh, Sumatra, and so going down like this. When an earthquake, big earthquake happens in that kind of geometry, it pushes an enormous volume of water out of the way. And a colleague of mine sat in her office and did a back of the envelope calculation, and by our estimate, and this is pretty rough, uh, a volume three times as big as the Great Salt Lake. That much water was shoved out of the way by this earthquake and set up this massive tsunami. And the tsunami went mostly in two directions because the faults oriented north-south, so the tsunami mostly sort of spread out that way. It hit in Indonesia very quickly, and then about two hours later, it crashed into uh, India, Sri Lanka and beyond. Uh, satellites were able to pick up the, the motion of the water, and that's this wiggly line. is actually the height of the wave as it passed by. But tsunamis, they travel through the open ocean about as fast as a jetliner, um, 500 miles an hour. As they get close to a coastline, they slow down, and the amplitude of the wave, the height, grows enormously because all, all of that energy just sort of piles up at the coastline. Uh, with catastrophic consequences. So the earthquake waves weren't much of a story, but the water waves clearly were. This is just one picture. I'm sure you've seen many on the news. Uh, you've probably seen video clips. Um, just a few images uh, that, are, that may be familiar. This is the Indian Ocean, and if you can see in red, it shows the areas that are, were, were badly impacted by the tsunami. And you can see they're mostly the, the beaches that are lined up north, south, east, west. So close to the epicenter Banda Aceh, uh, which is now a household word, didn't used to be, just catastrophic devastation. Uh, water that reached, uh, according to one of my colleagues, he thought at least 20 to 30 meters high. It was so tall that he wasn't able to measure it. This is, you go out in the field, you look for marks sort of where debris was left behind. There's ways you can tell how high the waves were. Um, in Thailand, obviously, considerable devastation, cars tossed around, uh, boats tossed around, and then way over in the Indian Ocean, uh, considerable devastation and loss of life. And this is what's hard to 
look at as a scientist because you know that the loss of life could have been pre prevented, at least over here, there should have been a couple of hours warning that this wave was on the way and, and it didn't happen. Uh, Sri Lanka, uh, also very hard hit. Fortunately, if you know Bangladesh, that's one uh, happy story in all this. Bangladesh, the whole country is like a foot above sea level. They regularly get flooded by cyclones. It's a massive problem. And the way the waves spread out, it didn't sort of make it up into Bangladesh, <clears throat> which was fortunate. Okay, so this is a picture that my colleague Jose Barrero took from Banda Aceh, a boat that got tossed around. And this earthquake left a lot of people wondering, can it happen here? And for the most part, you don't have to ask that if you live near a coast. Um, it has happened here, or at least it, it could happen here. And, and now I have to explain what I, what I mean by here. So it's sort of a key question. Well, cl somewhat close to home is the Good Friday Alaska earthquake that I told you about in 1964. This generated uh, one of the largest tsunamis on record, if not the largest. Uh, the estimated wave height reached around 60 meters. So if you've ever stood on a football field at the goal line and looked past the Oh, what the, the middle to the, the opposing 30-yard line, now imagine a wall of water that tall. That's what we're talking about in Valdez, where the harbor sort of focused the energy, and you can see some of the effects. You know, huge ships, trucks just tossed around. Okay, well, Alaska is still pretty far from home for most of us. Um, a little closer to home, uh, where I live anyway, uh, is the Pacific Northwest that I want to talk about just a little bit. This is probably within the contiguous U.S. the closest analogy that you're going to find to uh, what happened in Indonesia. And back when I was in grad school a million years ago, um, there was actually debate about whether or not big earthquakes could happen in this part of the world. It was known to be a subduction zone, the same kind of geometry that you have uh, in, in Indonesia, Sumatra, uh, but in a, just a few cases, zones like this don't produce big earthquakes. Uh, the, the ocean crust is sinking and it's able to sink fairly steadily in just a few cases, and people thought that maybe that was going on up here and you wouldn't ever get these massive earthquakes. And then in the early 80s, people started to think, well, you know, this really looked like a zone that might produce large earthquakes. And a geologist uh, by name of Brian Atwater, who is based up in Seattle, started looking around. He was doing his field work, and he noticed these big, thick layers of sand um, that was obviously beach sand, but it was in places that beach sand didn't belong. And it looked a lot to him like tsunami deposits. And these waves come in, they carry sand, they leave it, and sometimes they leave it in places where sand doesn't belong. So he found these big, thick layers, and he got curious, and he started poking around more. And then he found what he calls ghost forests. Brian is actually standing there. You probably can't see him. But these are uh, giant forests where, if you look at it, the trees died because they were inundated with salt water. Um, and the trunks, in some cases, have remained standing. So all of this led Brian and his geologic colleagues to think that maybe he was looking at evidence of a great earthquake that had caused a great tsunami in this region. Uh, maybe a few hundred years ago. And it's a, it, this is a really neat scientific detective story. Turns out the smoking gun uh, wasn't found in the Pacific Northwest, but rather in Japan. Um, so a few hundred years ago, there weren't people who were keeping records in this part of the world. But off in Japan, uh, they did have a very well-established culture with a tradition of written record keeping. They were quite familiar with earthquakes. This is an old print. Uh, there was sort of mythology about giant catfish things that would move under the water and, and cause earthquakes. So they knew about earthquakes, and they knew about tsunamis. They knew that tsunamis sometimes happened after earthquakes, and they knew that tsunamis sometimes happened when no earthquake was felt, and various people were keeping various kinds of records. Well, uh, a, a seismologist by name of Kenji Sataki went and found records of one particular tsunami. They called it an orphan tsunami because it didn't have an earthquake attached to it. And 
There were records of this from at least a half dozen different locations where people described the height of the wave. And by looking at these, Sataki showed that they could really only be explained by a massive earthquake, and it pretty much had to be along the Pacific Northwest. And because you have written records of this, we know the exact date of this earthquake. It was about 9 o'clock at night, January 26, in the year 1700. So we've just passed the 305th anniversary of this great Cascadia earthquake. Okay, well, it turns out that 300 years ago there were people living in the Pacific Northwest. Um, oh, I should say that the initial estimate of this was a magnitude 9, and that's really held up. The more people have looked at it, they've looked at the tsunami, uh, the more the analysis has confirmed that you really are looking at another truly massive earthquake. So the people who were living there, it turns out, you know, that this was obviously a big event for them. They did preserve a record of it, largely in symbolic terms, in the myths and legends that have developed in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, one of my colleagues, Luth, Luth Rudwin, no, Ruth Ludwin at the uh, University of Washington has got dived into the, the legends of Pacific Northwest tribes and shown how they can be related to uh, this very big earthquake. One of the things she's talked about is the, the thunderbird and whale motif, which runs through Pacific Northwest mythology commonly, um, is very plausibly linked to this great event and maybe even earthquakes before 1700. And she's taken it a step further, which I think is really cool, by differentiating legends with what she calls stories. The Native American tribes didn't have a tradition of written storytelling. They had an explicit tradition of oral storytelling. That's how they kept culture and history alive, was stories from father to son, from grandfather to grandson. And here's, just, here's a, a very small excerpt of one. <clears throat> Some of these stories were first transcribed in the middle of the 19th century uh, by people who realized that maybe they should be preserved in writing. And here's one, stories from my grandfather's fa father's, uh, sorry, grandfather's father, it gives the time he was born, how many generations ago. The land shook, a big wave smashed onto the beach. Well, it turns out, okay, next slide. When you give a talk at a museum, they kindly provide you with a, uh, guidelines for, for how to put together an effective slide, and this slide breaks all the rules that they give you. But I'm showing it for a reason. I want to sh it just sort of represents the amount of scholarship that Ruth Ludwin has done, and I'll try to explain it. If you go down the list here, there are stories listed from 1 to 32. Those are 32 different stories that she's read. Uh, group by area, British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, California. And then going across the columns are different effects that are talked about in the story. Some talk about flooding, shaking, uh, damage. Uh, some use thunderbirds, some use whales. Some of them talk about the time of year, uh, winter. Some say night. Uh, only one says day. Most of them that specify say a winter night. And if you sort of go through, and they all give enough information that you can try to estimate a date by looking at sort of how long a generation is. And they're actually listed on the side here, and they all say things like, you know, this was in so-and-so's time. So this is a timeline over here, and it's centered on the year 1700. And if you go through and look at where all the estimates fall, where you can make them, they, they're centered right smack on 1700. So here is the historic record of this earthquake that happened 300 years ago. It's not the kind of historic record that we think about because it wasn't written down originally, but these, these traditional oral um, stories essentially are a record. And that actually leads into what I was going to talk about at the very end of my talk. Uh, but before I do that, I want to just say a few more words about tsunami hazard in general. Now, this is a picture. It's a composite image of what the Earth looks like, and I gave this talk to a group of high school kids, and some of them are attend talks because they're dragged there, not because they want to be there. So I like to sort of ask them questions to make sure they're awake and alive. And 
So one of the questions I ask them is, how would you know that this is a composite image of the Earth? So I'll ask you now. It's all nighttime, right. And so the Earth is not all dark at once. It's, it's not, it's okay. I, <laughs> I've heard all the right answers very quickly. It's, the Earth is not flat. You couldn't take a snapshot of it. And that's the one the kids came up with. What, the, what, what they didn't immediately sort of think about, I heard over here, you couldn't take a picture of a cloudless Earth like this. So you, ha you would have to put this together um, as a composite. But it's sort of, it's an interesting image to look at. It's on the web, uh, smart people at NASA and, and elsewhere have put it together. Um, you can see any number of interesting things. India is just you know, illuminated all over. But one of the things you can see if you look closely is that the coastlines really stand out with bright illumination. And since the dawn of time, uh, humans have migrated to the coastlines to live. Uh, the climate tends to be more moderate than inland. Uh, not always. Uh, you have fish, but uh, obviously, importantly, for places like Boston, these were the major trade ports from the earliest time, and these are where the, the cities, the large cities, have by and large grown up. Now, in some of this, these cases, coastlines are active plate boundaries. Like out in California, the Pacific plate is moving relative to the North American plate. That's why we have the San Andreas Fault. That's why we're earthquake country. Here on the Atlantic coast, the, you have the Atlantic Ocean, which is an oceanic plate that's against the North American plate. They're sort of stuck together. They don't move relative to each other. So that's why you don't have the equivalent of a San Andreas Fault. You do have some earthquakes in this kind of setting. But on any coastline, you've got uh, some degree of tsunami hazard. And so let me talk about that. Okay, this is an image of... The seafloor, if you took away the water in a location offshore of California, and another question I asked the kids is if anyone can tell what it is we're looking at. No, not the place, but sort of as a, a general thing. You know, you can see the coast here, but what is it that we're looking at right there? Shelf. No, it, okay, it's not, it, uh, that's a good guess, but this isn't the continental shelf per se, sort of this part of it. La it's, okay, that's getting closer. It looks like lava flow. It's not lava. Landslide. There we go. This is an underwater landslide that by looking at it, uh, scientists have actually been able to see three different landslide episodes. And if you look, this is bathymetry, which just means underwater topography. You can find this sort of thing. They happen underwater, uh, sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly. Sometimes they happen in conjunction with earthquakes. And when these happen, just like, you know, this kind of subduction zone earthquake, uh, it's shoving a huge amount of water out of the way, and it can generate a tsunami. So this is a, a tombstone. Uh, I know you can't read it, but I show you because you can see it's an actual photo of an actual tombstone. I put it on the, the cover of the journal that I'm editing right now. Um, and I can read the details. It's uh, Thomas George Hillier drowned in the tidal wave disaster of November 18th, 1929. This is a, or nine or seven? Nine, okay. Sometimes these details sort of escape me. Uh, this is near the coast of Newfoundland. So just not too far north of here. There was a big earthquake offshore, 1929, magnitude 7.2, that part of this earthquake was a massive landslide. It caused a tsunami and the tsunami actually killed a small number of people. So anywhere along coastlines, this is a hazard that is not uh, likely to happen, but it is possible. And there's another sort of even more unlikely but, but still possible scenario, and that's you have, if you have volcanic islands, uh, sometimes they build up and, and eventually collapse, and a big chunk of an island can fall into the ocean. That's another way to get a tsunami. And that could happen in the Canary Islands and send a tsunami into uh, the Atlantic coast. And so this is something that people were sort of thinking about in the aftermath of the recent disaster. Again, they're, they're uncommon events. They're not things we would expect to see, uh, but they are within the realm of possibility.
Fortunately, with tsunamis, especially a tsunami that happens that was generated a long way away, uh, you're, going to, you're going to tend to get warning through uh, the news media, uh, warning, tsunami warning systems. There's now obviously a renewed effort to actually develop these and you know, make sure they're funded and, and operating, which is always nice. Um, but if you are ever at the beach or near the coast, there's very simple information that, that can save your life. If you feel an earthquake or if you don't feel an earthquake but the water all of a sudden rushes out, do not, under any circumstances, walk out and start picking up seashells. Because a tsunami is a wave. A wave come, has an inward part and an outward part. And if the water all of a sudden rushes out, that means that it's the, the front part of the tsunami is a rushing out. The next part of the tsunami is going to be a rushing in. So if the water rushes out, that's your cue to run for the hills and fast and take everyone around you with you. Okay. So that said, I want to get back to this issue of earthquakes and uh, Native American early uh, cultures and sort of the interplay between uh, early cultures and geologic unrest. And this, you're looking at this going, okay, what does that have to do with anything? And actually, let me start with this one since it's closer to home or closer to you guys. Okay, this is an internet a uh, web page, a colleague of mine, David Wall, took the lead in developing this just a few years ago. It's a page where you can go in, if you feel an earthquake, you can go to this website and fill out a questionnaire and, and answer some questions about what happened. Did you feel it? Did, others, did other people feel it? Did your light swing? Was there damage? You go through this and the system goes off and does its thing and builds up this map that shows you how the earthquake was felt. Now, this was in uh, near Plattsburgh, New York, a couple of years ago. Did anyone here feel this? A couple of people. Have you gone to the website? Okay. You could. It's these pages stay up. People actually go back and fill out questionnaires for older earthquakes sometimes. Um, but anyway, so this website, so this is for the New York earthquake, magnitude 5.1, so not a, a hugely big earthquake. But nearly 10,000 people went to this website and went to the trouble of filling out this questionnaire. Uh, this is the earthquake that happened near Paso Robles in California, uh, gosh, a little over a year ago, magnitude six and a half-ish. 17,000 people went to the trouble of going to the website and, and filling out this questionnaire. And so you ask yourself, why do people do this? Why, you know, why are they willing to, to go through this trouble? And I think one of the answers is that after you feel an earthquake, it's sort of an innately human trait to want to talk about it. You want to share your feelings. Um, it's sort of a, the process of catharsis where you, you sort of work everything out. Um, and so that nowadays that gives us these tremendous maps to the Internet. Well, the world was inhabited for thousands of years before the internet came along and people like us were wandering around uh, experiencing earthquakes and so how did they deal with them? This is a, a picture I grabbed from the web. It's not from a location not far from where I live in the desert of California and I, I didn't have to look too hard to find this picture that shows these giant palm trees, a natural palm oasis in the background which is sort of highlights a point. If you go out in the California desert, it turns out that these natural palm oases, you could sort of see them here. This is near Palm Springs. That's the San Andreas Fault. Those trees are following the fault uh, very neatly. What happens is a fault underground is moving blocks of crust. So you have different kinds of rock against each other. You have the, the rocks that are right along the fault have been ground up. It disrupts the groundwater and in a way that often causes water to burble up to the surface, even in a very urban areas. So for this and other reasons, traditional cultures not only lived in earthquake country, but they actually migrated specifically in a lot of cases to live directly on top of the faults. So these people were out there, they were feeling earthquakes. And one of the things I sort of fell into by accident in recent years concerns the Native American tribes in California and the possibility that like the Pacific Northwest tribes, they did leave a record of their experiences, just not a conventional one. And so these symbols here 
show uh, five of the more notable petroglyph sites, rock art sites in California. And just at first blush, you look at that, and it's also a fault map uh, with San Andreas is here. There's other faults over here. Just at first blush, you say that this, the, the colored symbol seems to land on the faults, which in itself doesn't tell you too much. But I just want to talk a little bit about two of these sites, uh, the red star and then this uh, red circle, purple star. Okay, so the red circle is COSO. And has anybody heard of COSO? Out here. No? It, it's, a pet, it's one of the best known petroglyph sites in the entire Great Basin. It's a region that's known to have been of enormous spiritual significance to early peoples of the Great Basin. People came for, from hundreds of miles to visit COSO. It's thought uh, largely for spiritual reasons. Uh, if you, it's known among or science circles because, although it's, it's, this isn't well known to the public, it's actually an active volcanic region. Uh, magma is close enough to the surface to generate heat that's now tapped for geothermal energy. It's a plant uh, jointly operated by the U.S. Navy because it's on a Navy base. But if you're able to go there, you find uh, sort of manifestations of active geothermal, we call activity. You have uh, steam vents. You have uh, chemical alterations of rocks. It's very sulfury. Um, Closer to the highway, you can see that's nearby the cinder cone. This is a remnant of an old volcano. The last big eruption in this area is 10,000 years ago. That overlaps with the period of human habitation. About four or 500 years ago, there was a smaller, uh, but still what must have been fairly dramatic eruption in this area. So let's look at the petroglyphs, this incredible concentration. I mean, just sort of staggering that's right next door to all of this volcanic activity. Well, this is sort of the signature uh, petroglyph group that you'll see in all the books. And if you go to the anthropology texts and read what they say about COSO, you will find out that COSO is all about rain shamanism, that drought and rain were, were issues of paramount concern for Great Basin tribes, obviously, uh, because they lived and died with the rains. And so all their spiritual beliefs all centered around rain, rain shamanism, et cetera. And so the fact that you have this immense concentration of petroglyphs has nothing to do with the fact that there's a volcano right next door. It has everything to do with rain, except that it's sort of hard to explain why people would come from hundreds of miles to visit COSO if it's all about rain. Whereas a seismologist looks at wiggly lines and other things besides rain come to mind. And throughout uh, Native American legend and mythology, wiggly lines are used commonly as representations for snakes and serpents. Snakes and serpents are used commonly as sort of representations for unrest within the earth, which gets us back to volcanoes. And this is another Coso petroglyph, if that's not an actual drawing of an actual volcano. I'll eat my hat, um, except I don't have one. Okay, so, and it sort of, it sort of looks like somebody, this is a, an anthropomorphic figure sort of knocked over, which isn't something you commonly see among petroglyphs. <clears throat> okay, so just one more site. This is, again, California and a location over here in the desert. In 1992, there was a quite large earthquake, Landers, magnitude 7.3. I'm going to talk about it uh, again later in my talk. Uh, I told you that earthquakes happen on faults. This one was about 60 or 70 kilometers, so about 40 miles, up through the desert. And I'm going to show you a petroglyph site from right there. Um, well, if you visit this site, you need four-wheel drive to get there. It's out in the boonies. You find wiggly lines everywhere. Uh, you see very few sheep. You see very few people. Lots and lots of wiggly lines. Some of them are vertical like this. Um, OK, so in 1992, when this earthquake happened, we had seismometers out there. And I'm not sure if you can see this, but this is a plot a colleague of mine made that shows you those seismograms. And this is the largest shaking that was recorded on a seismometer. It was strong enough that if you had been sitting there in a seat, the earthquake could have thrown you, nearly thrown you out of your seat. It was that strong. Well, the geologists now know that the last time earthquakes like this happened was about 9,000 years ago. 
And again, that's when you had people living in this area. Well, if you look at where this petroglyph site is, if you can compare those two, this site happens to be maybe a few miles, maybe, from the seismometer that later recorded this. And so I'll leave you with the idea that maybe you're looking at a 7,000 BC seismogram. Okay, so just to end this part of the talk, now that I'm down to the last 15 minutes, with some general comments. Um, have, have people here seen Yellowstone, I assume, or Hawaii, uh, active volcanic areas? These places are impressive, right? They're, you see steam vents, you, they smell like sulfur, they're hot. This is a picture from Mount Lassen, which is actually an active volcano in Northern California. And then one of my little movies, this is a mud volcano down near the Salton Sea. It's called a mud volcano. There's enough heat that it's sort of fluids come to the surface. They go through the sediments, and they make the mud kind of burble and, and such. And these, it's going to pan back in a second. I was, the resolution is kind of crummy. So they sort of build up, and this is my colleague John Tinsley for scale. So you have this kind of dramatic effect. Um, Okay, just one more slide. Uh, closer to home, there's a, uh, near East Haddam, Connecticut, there's a place that the early settlers called Devil's Hop Yard, and it's not clear why the association with the devil. But very near to there, there's a place called Mutus. Have you guys heard of Mutus? And it's, it, the name is derived from Native American, and I don't know how to pronounce this. I don't know how you interpret it into sign language. Uh, Machimadoset is my best guess, and it translates literally into place of bad noises. Seismologists have been able to figure out that in this sort of very specific area, for reasons we, we don't have a good handle on, you have lots and lots of little earthquakes, uh, tiny events, but they're heard more than they're felt. Earthquake waves are sound waves for the most part in the earth, and in some cases you can hear them. And people here, going back to native days, were hearing these noises. Uh, there's a quote that the local tribe was called on to interpret the many voices of the evil deity. And so it clearly, in this case, earthquake activity was, was giving rise to or creating these legends of, of evil spirits deep in the earth. And the question that I think is interesting to think about is, Back when people were first sort of running around without any scientific framework or without any established religion, where did their ideas of the underworld come from in the first place? And I think it's plausible, if not probable, that their, their ideas came from the underworld itself, specifically from these areas where there's persistent geologic or, or uh, earthquake unrest that, that early people wouldn't have been able to interpret scientifically, instead it gave them their earliest demons. Okay, so all of that, if I presented it in a seismology meeting, um, people might think it was interesting, but they would think it's certainly not seismology. Uh, I'm not sure what it is myself. I have a, an essay that, that talks about some of that uh, as a handout if you're interested. Uh, but now, at the very end of my talk, I sort of want to get around to this voyage of discovery that is about seismology. And this gets us back to the issue of earthquake waves. And 50 years ago, Charles Richter said, an earthquake of consequence is never an isolated event. And what it's hard to know exactly what he had in mind, but you can guess that back 50 years ago, scientists knew that a big earthquake sometimes has foreshocks. About half the time, a big earthquake will have a foreshock or one or more. And nearly all the time, a big earthquake has lots of aftershocks. And this is a graph. There's some screaming next door. Okay. Um, the <laughs> in 94, there was a, a big earthquake in Southern California, north of Los Angeles, uh, the Northridge earthquake. And this is just a plot. Typically, aftershocks of an earthquake sort of clump around the area where the fault moved in the main shock. And so this has been known for, for actually centuries. Just in the last... 10 or 15 years, scientists have come up with, I think, a better understanding of why aftershocks happen, and I just want to talk about that briefly. It's sort of a mechanical effect that when a big earthquake happens, the fault moves, you're really shoving real estate around. Now think about what happens at the edges of those faults. You're sort of, 
you know, shoving things, moving them into other things. And what happens is you increase the stress around the, the fault that breaks. So here's our, our friend Landers again, and a plot worked by uh, several colleagues of mine, including Ross Stein, the USGS in Menlo Park. These red areas show where the stress was increased because of this earthquake. In some areas, the stress has decreased. Uh, and the observation has been that aftershocks, including this very large Big Bear aftershock, magnitude 6.5, they tend to cluster in the areas where the stress is increased. And the, a sort of simple in a model for this or analogy is actually dominoes. You, that's, that's, <laughs> this is one of my kids. I've got a 17-year-old who's a, a graphic artist wizard. Um, so the idea is that dominoes sort of fall and hit each other. Earthquakes can sort of do the same thing, although not at that kind of speed usually. Um, once a big earthquake happens, it's the domino effect can sort of account for a lot of the aftershocks. In some cases, it can also account for earthquakes, big earthquakes that happen uh, fairly close together. Like in 1971, we had the San Fernando earthquake. 20 years later, we had Northridge. Well, that's not exactly toppling dominoes like this, but it's thought that those two are related, that the first one kind of pushed and made the second one more likely. Uh, an example from my own research, which I think is, is really pretty uh, fun, is the New Madrid earthquakes. Have people heard of New Madrid and earthquakes in 18, 11, and 12? Have you heard their magnitude 8s? They weren't magnitude 8s. They were low magnitude 7s, and there's been some lore about these earthquakes that sort of led to its own mythology. And, and what, have you heard that church bells rang in Boston? Please erase that from your mind. It didn't happen. Um, <laughs> It's a long story. It's gotten into the lore, and you can't get rid of it. But according to the newspapers, everything we can tell, the earthquakes weren't actually felt in Boston, although they, they were felt weekly up into New York. Okay, so these earthquakes happened. It was a series of four large earthquakes from December 1811 until February 1812. Uh, and if you look at that area now, you see little earthquakes happening. It's the boot heel of Missouri. Uh, we have a pretty good handle of about the faults now that move to produce these earthquakes. But interestingly, uh, all of these earthquakes that happen now, I think the best interpretation is that these are aftershocks of main shocks that happened nearly 200 years ago, which seems strange, but uh, it's, uh, and it's something I don't have time to get into, but it's really quite, it's sort of the, the best supported interpretation. And it turns out if you do this sort of new analysis and you look at how these earthquakes changed the stress 200 years ago. It's consistent with this pattern of earthquakes that you see today. So these long-lived aftershocks uh, are still responding to the way the faults moved 200 years ago. Okay, so that, those are aftershocks. But what I really wanted to talk about, and now I'm down to 10 minutes, is what we call remotely triggered earthquakes. Uh, in 1992, this Lander, Lander's earthquake happened down here. And this is a plot that shows if you can look, the little dots are earthquakes that happened in the month following the Landers main shock. And where it's contoured red are places where the earthquake activity is higher after Landers than before. And where it's contoured yellow, it's, it's a lot higher. And so what you can see from this and what was obvious immediately is the state of California lit up like a Christmas tree. On, on, a, on an earthquake map after this, this earthquake happened, clearly this was all caused by this earthquake. And so this led to this new class of earthquakes that we just had not recognized prior to 1992. We call them remotely triggered earthquakes. So this is a, a sort of illustration from another earthquake that happened in the desert in 1999. Uh, the earthquake happened up here. The aftershocks were up here. In this case, the triggered earthquakes happened down here, so some distance away. And it so happened that there was a seismometer sitting here, and I'm going to show you what it recorded. So a modern seismometer records three different measurements, the north, south, east, west, and up, down. That lets you characterize all the motion. So this is the Hector Mine earthquake magnitude 7. At this site, it came, rumbled along, and then boom. This is, I think you can see just by eye, this is a separate earthquake that happened 
right underneath where the seismometer is located. This is a 7.1, the, the main shock, much bigger. This is a 4.7, smaller earthquake, but directly under your feet, and so it looks like this. So, okay, uh, what do we make of these earthquakes, and what are they telling us? Well, one of the first things that you can say about them, if you look at where they happen, uh, they happen mostly in volcanic and geothermal regions. And one of the characteristics of these regions is an abundance of fluids. You have magma deep in the earth. Uh, you may have sort of hydrothermal geyser type things. This is the geysers uh, north of San Francisco. Uh, this is hot springs near Mammoth Lakes in, in Northern California. This you may recognize as Yellowstone. So you have a lot of fluids. And so what people think is happening, one analogy for this is shaking a soda can. So you take a soda can and imagine this in the earth and earthquake waves come along and start shaking the soda can and shake the can and shake the can. And what happens after a while is, is the can explodes. Okay, that, that's my 17 year old being cute, but you know what happens. The, the pressure rises in a can because you're disrupting the bubbles and you raise the pressure in a can, it'll spray all over the place. So the idea was that if you have fluid underground, waves come along, they shake things up, maybe they're sort of doing something similar and causing pressure to rise and in a way that causes earthquakes. So one of the things I've been looking at is, okay, let's take away the soda can, take that out of the equation. Can these waves that ripple through the earth still cause triggered earthquakes? And some people say no, I think yes. Um, okay, I think I want to, well, no, I don't want to skip that, I'll go through it. Uh, going back to this New Madrid sequence, you had four quite large earthquakes uh, that were uh, four different days, and they weren't these great, enormous earthquakes, but we know they're pretty big earthquakes, and we know this because they were felt over uh, quite a large area. This is a, a figure that I put together uh, by looking at compilations of how the earthquakes were felt and the kind of damage that they did. You can put together these maps. Uh, this is a similar map for the Buj India earthquake of 2001, which we know was a magnitude 7.6. And these patterns are quite similar, and so that sort of provides evidence that these earthquakes were, in fact, uh, magnitude 7 to 7.5, which is quite large. And, okay, big earthquakes have aftershocks, and I know you can't read this, but I put it up here because I want to read it. Um, there were people out there in the mid-continent that were keeping records of every shock that they felt. There was one engineer in Louisville, Kentucky, and a medical doctor in Cincinnati who just sort of deputized themselves as amateur seismologists and kept these extensive records, and people have gone back to them. But there's a uh, one particular earthquake. If you read how it was described in Louisville, Kentucky, actually, I won't read it because I'm running out of time, it really suggests to a seismologist that this particular earthquake was close to Louisville, Kentucky, that it wasn't way over in the New Madrid area. And if you pull all of these accounts together, uh, for, for years, seismologists assumed that they were all aftershocks. Some of them, as it turns out, were not clearly not located in the New Madrid area. Uh, this particular one was February 7th, 1812 at night. It was pretty clearly centered in the Louisville, Cincinnati area. It was felt as far, as far away as New Jersey and, and down here. Uh, so this was a pretty big earthquake, magnitude five and a half or so, uh, that was in fact one of these triggered events. And I'm gonna go through this quickly. I've already shown you this seismogram. Now back in 1811 and 12, you didn't have any seismograms. But you can sort of ask yourself, suppose you were standing here as a human seismometer and you felt that, what would it feel like? You're gonna feel a pretty good rumble. This is a strong enough shaking that you're gonna feel it, but then all of a sudden, wham, this thing is gonna hit as a really strong, especially strong jolt. And if you look back into the records of, of how people describe these earthquakes 200 years ago, it turns out they left some descriptions that sound very much like the seismogram. Um, and I won't go through them, but what these accounts that people left uh, make it sound again as if earthquakes happened over in this area following main shocks way over here. 
Okay, one of the things that I'm actually working on now, sort of an extension of that, is what I call earthquake halos. And let me show you two maps. If you look at, uh, this is uh, generated after an earthquake in Quebec. It was a magnitude five and a half-ish. This is the Koalinga earthquake, magnitude around six. And these figures, they're red where earthquakes, there were more earthquakes after the, earth, after the, the main shock than there were in the month before. Where they're blue, that means there were more earthquakes before than after. And so you see the aftershocks in both of these. But if you look at a lot of these, and I have, uh, I've convinced myself that there's another subtle si signal in here, which are sort of halos where you tend to see an increase sort of ring around the main shock. Now, these halos are sort of elliptical. And I think my last question for the kids was, why would a halo look elliptical, seismology aside, there's sort of a, a I'm sorry? It's along a line, um, sort of. The angle? The earth is round. Okay, that's getting there. Okay, it has... That would be the case in some cases, but that's not actually what's going on here. No. Nope. One of the kids actually got this. I was amazed. Without a hint, but I'll give you a hint. Yes. That's, that's you know your geometry, but it, uh, that's true, but it's, it's not sort of the, the basic explanation is, is sort of simpler than that. I'm sorry? Gravity. No, it's not gravity. It has to do with the fact that the Earth is round and maps are flat. No? Projection. That's it. The map projection. Lines of longitude meet at the pole. So if you make a flat map, you typically stretch those out. So that means that most maps that you look at are distorted to some extent and a circle on a globe turns into sort of a flattened circle on a map. So there we go. Okay. So leaving that diversion aside, um, it's actually uh, it's something you don't think about, but the maps we're all familiar with are really quite distorted in terms of how big countries are because we've distorted the heck out of anything that's close to the poles relative to things that are close to the equator. Okay, so um, one of the things, uh, getting towards my very last sl slides, if you take plots like this and just look at the center where the main shock happened and then sort of calculate how earthquakes change just as a function of distance. So this is plotting now sort of the rate of earthquakes against distance. There's a whole bunch of curves from different earthquakes, but what I've seen is that the curves are very high close in. Those are the aftershocks. The curves fall. But an awful lot of these curves fall down and bounce back up. And my interpretation of this is that these are triggered earthquakes that are happening, uh, not a lot of them, but they're happening at uh, a similar range of distances, about 80 to 100 kilometers. And that's an interesting distance range for seismology. So when an earthquake happens, waves spread out in the earth, uh, some of the energy goes down, and in the crust there's a layer that we call the moho, that's a boundary that's found just about everywhere. And it turns out that if waves hit this boundary steeply, most of the energy keeps going. If they hit it at a certain angle, most of the energy starts being reflected, and that's sort of simple ray theory. But these waves, so you start to get these bouncing waves right around this distance where I think you're starting to get extra earthquakes. So my theory is that these bouncing waves are triggering earthquakes, not a lot, but enough that you can see them over and over. Okay, so why do we care? Um, well, it turns out that in seismology these days, we know quite a bit about what happens on a fault after an earthquake starts. By analyzing seismic data, people come up with actual models of how the fault is moving. Um, but we really don't know how they start, why they start, why 2.30 on Tuesday, not 4.30 on Wednesday, and if you think about the earthquake prediction problem, you know, why it's been so tough, uh, 
One of the fundamental reasons is that we don't really know what we're looking for. We don't know how earthquakes start, why they start. We don't know if that gives us any sort of signal ahead of time that we might be able to observe and know that an earthquake is coming. Well, in, for now, I'm sorry, now for a small number of earthquakes, we know exactly how and why they started, or at least why. They started because the shaking came through and, and shook things up, and I need to finish. But the, the hope is that by understanding what's going on here, we might be able to understand something about how all earthquakes start and what's really happening on the faults. Uh, did Sumatra trigger earthquakes? It's a good question. Uh, it's very hard to answer. Blue dots are earthquakes before Sumatra happened. Red dots are earthquakes after. And it looks like there's some events up here. It's a statistical problem. You have to show that these earthquakes aren't just things that might have happened anyway. OK, this is my second to last slide. Um, so OK, uh, finally, something very close to home. In 1755, on November 1st, a great earthquake happened in Lisbon, actually generated a huge tsunami, a lot of devastation. 17 days later, you had the biggest historic earthquake in New England, the Cape Ann, Massachusetts earthquake, and there's a wood cutting shown here. So 15 years ago, seismologists would have said, this is just a coincidence. There's no way these two earthquakes are related. Now we can't say for sure that they are. But given what we know, we have to entertain the possibility that, yes, maybe this earthquake caused this earthquake to happen. So a final slide. Uh, I want to end with sort of an awful phrase because it's overused, but this idea of paradigm shift. Uh, sometimes it, it's the best way to explain what's going on in science when you sort of have these revolutions and a new way of looking at things. Uh, plate tectonics uh, is a well-known one where all of a sudden it was a, a picture of looking at the whole Earth in a way that things fit together. And I think we're in the middle of another revolution that has to do with earthquake interactions, of how the earthquakes fit together and how the earthquakes communicate with each other in some of the ways that I've talked about. Now, this revolution isn't over yet. Uh, there's a lot of it, very interesting ideas. Uh, there's a lot of controversy. Not all of my colleagues believe me when I talk about earthquake halos and bouncing waves, for example. So sometimes it seems like there's really more questions than answers. But you know, there's just so many new ideas and so much happening at once that this is really the reason why science is such a blast sometimes. So I'd like to thank you for letting me share that with you tonight. Take some questions. When, when, you, when you have studied earthquakes over time and in, and in space geography, do you find that they are, in fact, statistically related in the sense that um, are they happening in clusters in time and space? I mean, it seems like that's something you could look at. Yeah, people are trying to, and that, I mean, that's really the hard question, because sometimes it sure seems like they're clustered. In 1906, there were at least three very large earthquakes around the world. And the question is, can you prove that that's just not a random you know, thing, that sometimes things clump in, in any random? And so the statistics is, are really tough, because we just don't have a very long window of data. And so that's the sort of exactly the sort of thing that people are, are struggling to, to figure out. Another question. Yeah, towards the back. Yeah. Well, that's you know we can't predict them, um, but. There, there have been damaging earthquakes in New England. Uh, the last big earthquake on the, the entire Atlantic coast, well, there was the Newfoundland quake offshore. In 1886, there was a quite large earthquake in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, probably magnitude 7-ish. And the thing is, you know, I said the Atlantic Ocean isn't moving relative to the North American continent. But you do have sort of this complicated geometry where you go from a continent to an ocean, and you do get earthquakes along regions like that, not like California or plate boundary, uh, but also sort of a higher rate than Minnesota. So earthquakes are possible. 
in Boston, New York City, Washington, they're just not considered likely. Uh, it's sort of a scary scenario because places like New York aren't prepared for earthquakes. You know, you put something, even something moderate, uh, you could someday see quite a bit of damage. And it's a tough problem because, you know, are you really going to go in and spend the money to retrofit old buildings given all the other priorities? Um, Another question. I'm going to grab Yeah, um, towards the back. Oh, oh okay. You, you next. Wasn't there talk of a possible undersea landslide at the Azores that would affect us? That's, yeah, there's a, a, I was talking to a guy, Steve Ward, in, um, in Santa Cruz, who's done some modeling of that. And you know, that's a sort of scenario where a landslide or a collapse of an island could generate a potentially large uh, tsunami. Um, it's not likely. You don't see those sorts of things every day, but they can happen. Uh, the one th in silver lining of this earthquake is that now, before this earthquake happened, if you tried to get money to operate tsunami early warning systems, you know, it was like pulling teeth. And for the Indian Ocean, forget it. You know, you just you weren't going to get funding for that. Well, now all of a sudden, people are convinced that it can be done and that it will save lives. I mean, it's not speculative. It, it works. And so if something happens in the Azores, we're going to know about it. We're going to have hours and hours of warning that something's on the way. Hi. Uh, lay people like me have been taught that earthquakes are a way of relieving stress between plates. Mm -hmm. Is the converse of your triggering theory in play? Are there quiet zones that result after earthquakes? Yeah, actually, that's a good point. When I showed you those pretty pictures with the red and the blue, uh, a big earthquake causes stress to increase in some areas. But as you say, what an earthquake does is mostly relieve stress. So it's those two things happen at the same time. Um, and if you look after a really big earthquake, the relieving of stress is going to be very important. Like after 1906, uh, the earthquake in San Francisco, uh, it looks like Northern California got pretty quiet for 75 years just because all the stress had sort of been sucked out of the system. Um, so that, that's something that happened. People talk about earthquake shadows. And, that, and that's one of the questions people are trying to figure out. You know, if you have a big earthquake, does, does it get more quiet or does it get more active? I mean, people are really debating that at a very fundamental level. One more question. We know that um, subduction zones create earthquakes. Now we hear that we could have them along the East Coast because of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Thank you. Uh, what caused them New Madrid? Is there, is uh, <laughs> that's a question near and dear to my heart. Yeah, I mean, you have stress anywhere on the planet. And here, you, North America is being compressed. I think you said it, because the, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is, is creating new crust. And that's sort of squeezing all of North America at a low level, so you're going to get some earthquakes. Uh, here in the Northeast, you, actually, you have an effect from the glaciers that were pushing down on the crust. They, they went away. The crust is still rebounding to this, this, the ice retreat thousands of years ago. What's going on in New Madrid is a question that seismologists argue about sort of endlessly. And understand it may have something to do with, with the ice. Because the ice didn't reach all the way down there, but if the ice came along and pushed the crust, it's like if you put your hand on a sofa, the sofa would sort of warp even beyond your hand. And so if you took your hand away, it, it, it would bounce back. So New Madrid may be part of that bouncing back still going on. I, that's as good an idea as, as I've heard. Oh, there's... Can I, the last part of that, I'm sorry, I missed an important part of that question. There is, uh, right at New Madrid, millions of years ago, the crust was pulling apart, what we call a rift. It was trying to split, and it never actually split. That stopped. But it sort of left this seam in the earth that's maybe kind of an old zone of weakness. So that's part of the story. Okay, I need to stop talking. Thank you. <laughs>